Stephen Thorne and Judith Paris. Hello. How nice to see you all. Okay. Hi, hello. So, Doctor Who, obviously, we're all here to talk about Doctor Who today. Oh, I thought it was Shakespeare. Okay, let's talk about Shakespeare. <laughs> so, in Hamlet, right. Um, okay, Stephen, you yes. have quite a huge association with Doctor Who. Well, not huge. Um, yes, you've been a in, certain, you've been a in certain, a certain, certain association. Yes. You've been in what a lot of fans call classic stories. I mean, we have to talk about it, the demons, obviously. Um, what was it like playing a character behind the mask? Is it any type, was it, frust an Omega as well, behind the mask, was it frustrating as an actor that you weren't actually seen on screen? No, not particularly, no. But it's very interesting playing behind a mask because you have to be very careful that you don't over, you tend when playing a monster, one of these huge creatures, to shriek and shout and whatever. But then you have to realize that the mask does half of the work for you because what you see is half, just as much important as what you hear. So the mask does half the work, so you needn't push so hard. So you have to keep it down and make it real. That's one of the problems. The other problem is uh, seeing where you are and moving about on the set, because the eye things are terribly small. Omega, for instance, as well, is, was very difficult to see where I was. And John Pertwee kept pushing me out of the way and I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm terribly sorry, Stephen, but I, I can't see the camera because you're different. <laughs> and I said, I can't see you, let alone the camera. I don't know where. Right, fine, you get it. He did the, about the third time he did this. Pat Troughton was, was there, the mercurial and wonderful Pat Troughton, said, John, what on earth's the matter with you? Why are you pushing? It doesn't matter where you are. He said, it's not you they want to see, it's the monster they want to see. <laughs> <laughs> did that go down well? Well, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the the Omega mask you were just mentioning, it had a sort of the theatrical mask look to it. You know, if you meet, if you know what I mean, the happy and tragic face. And um, did you think that his character was quite a tragic character? Was it a very sad character? It was at the end, yes, when all was lost and everything. And interesting about that, Barry Letts came to the, see the last sort of dress rehearsal of that. And you know when he takes the mask off and there's nothing there. I uh, used to do, well, up to that point, I was doing a dreadful and awful howl of horror and anguish and whatever. And Barry Letts was there with some children he brought to see this run and came down afterwards and said, Steve, no, I'm sorry, you must tone that down. He said, it's, <laughs> it's too much for the children. They can't take that sort of dreadful howling. I said, oh dear, that's very sad. And Lenny Main, who directed it, didn't, am I right? Um, was it Lenny Main? Yeah, yeah, it? Yes, you. it was. Was very upset and said, no, you should be allowed to do that. But he was overruled. So there we are. Okay. He was also terribly upset about the set, Lenny Main, in that, who also directed Hand of Beer, because he thought Omega's Palace should be absolutely amazing and gobsmackingly awesome, and it wasn't really. And he was very upset and disappointed by that. There we are. Judith. Aren't you going to ask him when he's going to take his mask off? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to mention it. Oh. <laughs> Judith. Hand of Fear. Yes. Eldrad must live. There we are, there we are. Hey, come on. And now for an encore, Stephen, can you say I am Omega? <laughs> um, your costume. Oh, yes. <laughs> was it very tight? It was very tight and it was very restrictive. I couldn't sit down. I didn't sit down for days. They used to lean me against a wall. In, in our breaks, because I, 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 there was no way I could um, articulate, because it was a, it was a cat suit stuck with rock crystals. <laughs> and once I was in, and they sewed me in, they stitched me into this costume, and um, and then I had all the, the things up the neck, and, the, and and I was literally it was very hard, and I couldn't drink water, not gin. I couldn't drink. <laughs> I couldn't drink at all because I couldn't pee, because there was no way I could get the costume off. 
so I didn't eat or drink or sit for days. All for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Mine was quite uncomfortable, too. <laughs> he t go tell him about the galoshes. Uh, the, the, the basis of my costume were red wellies. No, not red wellies. Yellow, uh, green. green wellies. You know those green wellies? At the bottom, up to here. And the rest of the costume is this awful rubber latex stuff, and it's terribly hot. And when I came to take it off, I have it prized off or peeled off me. I would empty out these green wellies and sort of half a pint of sweat would dribble onto the floor with having acted as a reservoir all day. Very uncomfortable indeed, she's quite right. And deserves a medal for looking so beautiful at the same time. And still does. <laughs> Judith. Um, no, I hated being turned into him. Yeah. See, <laughs> preempts my next question. It's great. Uh, one, Kevin over there directed uh, one of my favourite uh, documentaries, the uh, documentary called 30 Years in the Tires, and it was the first time I saw your character, and it's your particular death scene. Yes. It looked so, just in that clip, taking it out of context for the whole story, it looked so violent. What do you remember of just doing that little scene? They nearly killed me. <laughs> That's what I remember, as if it was, as if it was yesterday. Um, when I was being transmogrified into mm -hmm. Stephen Thorne here, um, they lay me on a bed and this, this machine came grinding down to grind me very thin and small. And uh, when we did the rehearsal, there was a dead marked um, in the, on the stage. The, the, the man who was working the machine had a dead to put on um, where the machine would stop just about there. <coughs> and the first time we, we did the take, the machine, the dead had dropped off. <laughs> and the machine went on, went on, went on, and it started to press on my nose. I was young and stupid. I should have let them break my nose. Then I could have got a nose job from the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, I'd have, I'd have let that thing... No, but it was very frightening, that, because I really... It, it, it is very uh, awful, the sound of this, this thing, and pressing down and pressing down, and nobody seemed to be doing anything about it, so... But I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you. A thing that uh, both of you do a lot of is radio drama mm. and radio acting. How is that different, or are there any differences, doing that form of acting to um, television and theatre? Is it more enjoyable? Or? It's a, bit, a lot more enjoyable because you don't have to learn the line. <laughs> there's, there's that advantage to it. No, it's enjoyable in its own right. I love it. It's splendid. It has I mean, there's no the radio acting. I don't I admit really of that expression. It's just acting the same as everything else, except what people don't realise, as opposed to film or television acting, radio acting, if you're going to call it that, needs a lot more energy, actually, mm. in the voice, because mm. you're doing everything with the voice. And if you just do it naturalistically, chatting away like this, it sounds dreadful, it sounds mm. flat. Well, I said if you could saw people at the same time, it wouldn't. You can't do that sort of whispering thing that people do on films while they're picking their nose and scratching and all that. You've got to give it a bit more energy, otherwise it goes for nothing. But it is a wonderful medium because all has, as everybody knows, has all the best pictures. Radio because they're all in here in your mind's head. Okay. I did a radio once, and a friend of mine said Judith Paris never knowingly underacted. <laughs> <laughs>